Good morning, good evening, or good night, depending on the time of day that you are listening to this. And welcome. This is the story of how three young children, not much older than you, discovered the wondrous adventures of the magical faraway tree. A city is no place for three mischievous children, especially Joe, Beth and Franny. They'd always longed for trees to climb and a big garden to play in. Luckily for them, the children's father had a new job in the countryside. This meant the children could finally build their dream tree house and frolic in the greenery. Chapter 1 Moonface and the Slippery Slip The children clung to the top of the branches of the faraway tree, whilst the rabbit slid down a bit lower. They could still hear the enchanting music of the roundabout land as it swung round overhead. We'd better get home. It's been just a bit too exciting. Come on then, it'll be easier to get down than it was to climb up. Franny was very tired. She began to cry as she clung to her branch. She was the youngest, and not so strong as Joe and Beth. I know I shall fall! Joe and Beth looked at one each other in alarm. There was such a long way to fall. Dear Franny, you simply must try. We've got to get home safely. But Franny clung to her branch and wept great tears. The two rabbits looked at her, most upset. One put his paw into her hand. I'll help you! But Franny would not be helped. She was tired out and afraid of everything. She wept so loudly that two birds nearly fell off in fright. Just as the others were really in despair, a small door flew open in the trunk of the tree not too far below, and around, Moonface looked out. Hey there, what's the matter? A fellow can't get any sleep with all that awful noise going on. Franny stopped crying and looked at Moonface in surprise. I'm crying because I'm frightened of what's going down on the tree. I'm sorry I woke you up. Have you got any toffee? Mmm, toffee. What do you want toffee for? Oh, to eat, of course. I just thought if you had any toffee to give me, I'd let you slide down my slippery slip. You dig down to the bottom very quickly that way. A slide that goes all the way down the faraway tree? Who would have thought of that? I thought of it. I let people use it if they pay me a toffee. Oh. Beth and Joe looked at each other in dismay. We've no toffee. I've a bar of chocolate, a bit squishy, but nice. Won't do. I, I don't like chocolate. What about the rabbits? Have they got any toffee? The rabbits turned out their pockets. They had a very curious collection of things, but no toffee. Sorry! Moonface slammed his door shut and Franny began to cry again. Joe climbed down to the door and banged on it. Hey, old Moonface! I'll bring you some lovely homemade toffees next time I'm up the tree, if you let us use your slippery slip. Why didn't you say so before? Come on in! One by one, the children and the rabbits climbed down to the door and went in. Right in the middle of Moonface's house was the beginning of the slippery slip down the whole trunk of the tree. The children were astonished and wished that they could stay for a while longer. You'll want a cushion each. Uh, hey, you rabbit, uh, you take the top one and go first. The smallest rabbit grabbed an orange cushion and propped himself at the top of the slip. Go on, but hurry up then. You don't want to stay all night, do you? He gave the rabbit a strong push and the rabbit slid down the slippery slip at a tremendous pace. Joe thought he looked like such fun, so he went next. I'll take the comfy blue cushion. Down went Joe on his blue cushion. His hair began to stream behind him in the wind. Round and round he went. Next in line for the slippery slip was Beth. Oh, can I please go next, Moonface? Uh, of course. Uh, here, take this green cushion. Beth slid down the slip with rapid speed and her cheeks flapping in the wind. Straight after her was Franny's turn. Eventually, all the rabbits and the children met at the bottom of the tree. They all laughed as it was really great fun to slide down the magical faraway tree. Come on, girls. If we get back early, Mother will let us come back and explore the faraway tree tomorrow. Oh yes, good idea, Joe. I can't wait to come back and see what lands at the top tomorrow. I'm not afraid of going up anymore now I know our new friend Moonface has a slippery slip. Joe, Beth and Franny all yelled up to Moonface to thank him for letting them use his slippery slip. See you soon, children. And don't forget my toffees.
Chapter 2. What happened in the rocking land. The rocking land was really most annoying. No sooner did the children stand up very carefully to try to walk a few steps, than the earth beneath them either fell away or tipped up slanted sideways in a very alarming manner. Then down they all went, rolling over and over. The saucepan man made a tremendous noise and almost cried when he saw how battered his saucepans and kettles were getting. Moonface, how can we get out of here, do you know? Oh, we can uh, get out by going down the ladder that leads to the faraway tree. Moonface began to roll down a little hill that suddenly appeared as if it was from nowhere. Look for, look for it all the time, or we'll never get away from here. As soon as the rocking land leaves the place where the faraway tree is, we'll have no way of escape. That gave the others a shock. The thought of living in a land of bumps and jolts was not pleasant at all. They all began to look about for the hole which they had come to the rocking land. Soon the earth began to do something very different. It heaved up and down very quickly as if it were breathing very fast. When it heaved up, it threw the children and the others into the air. When it breathed downwards, they rolled into holes and stayed there. It was dreadfully uncomfortable. I'm getting awfully bruised. For goodness sake, let's find a place on this land where it's not quite so fidgety. I think we must be on the worst bit. As soon as the earth stopped heaving about, they all ran hard to where wood grew. And there, just inside the wood, they saw a shop. It was a surprising thing to see in the rocking land. So surprising, in fact, they all just stopped and stared. What does it sell? You don't feel well? I don't either. I feel as if I've been on a ship in a very rough sea. I said, what does the shop sell? Uh, no, I didn't hear a bell. Joe gave up. He looked hard at the shop. It was just a tall, wide stall with a tiny house behind it. No one seemed to be there, but smoke rose from the chimney, so someone must live there, Joe thought. Come on. Take hold of each other's hands so that we can keep together. We'll go and see this funny shop and see if we can get some help. They walked up to it. The stool was piled high with cushions of all colours, each one with a rope tied to it. How funny! Cushions with ropes! Who in the world would want to buy cushions here? Well, uh, I for one, my goodness. If I had a fine fat cushion tied to the front of me and another tied to the back, I wouldn't mind being bumped around nearly so much. Oh, of course! That's what the cushions and ropes are for. Let's buy some. We won't get bruised anymore. Just then, a sharp-nosed little woman with cushions tied all around her came out of the tiny house and looked at the children. She even had a small cushion tied to her head. Oh, how she did look funny. Franny giggled. She was such a dreadful giggler. The woman looked cross as she glared at Franny. Do you want to buy my cushions? Uh, yes, please. How much are they? Five silver pieces of money each. That's much too high of a price. I only have one silver piece. Uh, have you got any money, saucepan man? No, I don't sell honey. Money, money, money. Oh, uh, money, uh, yes, I've plenty in here. But the round leather bag was empty. Oh, my money must have fallen out when I rolled about. There's nothing left. The children had no money at all. The sharp-nosed little woman shook her head when Moonface begged her to lend them some cushions in return for his silver piece. I don't lend anything. It's too bad, mean old thing. Oh look, there are some more people all wearing cushions. Sure enough, they met plenty of odd-looking folk, well padded with cushions of all colours, shapes and sizes, walking carefully about the path. One man wore a big quilt all around him which Beth thought was a fine idea. Ooh! Wish I had a few cushions. Crash, clank, bang went the saucepan man rolling on his kettles and pans very noisily. Oh look! The earth there had risen steeply upwards and all the cushions were rolling down towards the children. Grab them! My goodness! It did make a difference when they rolled about. It serves that mean old woman right! Saucepan Man tried his hardest to put the cushions around himself and his saucepans. Suddenly, one of the people of the rocking land gave a frightened shout and clutched hold of a nearby tree. A strained wind blew with a low, musical sound. Now, what's going to happen? 
Gets a hold of a tree. When the wind makes that sound, it means the whole of the land's going to tip up sideways and try and roll everybody off. Your only hope is to catch hold of a tree. Sure enough, the land was tipping up. Not in bits and pieces as it had before, but the whole of it. It was extraordinary. Moonface was frightened. He tried to get a tree and shouted to the others. Catch hold of a tree! Hurry up! But not one of them could, for they had left the wood behind them and they were now in a field. Slowly and surely, the land tipped sideways and the children, the moon face and old saucepan man began to roll downhill on their cushions. They were not bruised, but they were very much frightened. Suddenly, Moonface disappeared as if he'd rolled off the land. I say, I say, everyone! I've fallen down the hole to the ladder that leads to the faraway tree, quite by accident. I'll throw my cushions up through the hole so you'll know where it is. Roll to it if you can, but hurry! Then the children and the saucepan man saw two cushions appear, and they knew where the hole was. And sure enough, one by one, they plopped down the hole, all finding themselves and their cushions back on the ladder of the faraway tree. All except the saucepan man and poor Franny. Oh, quick, quick, quick! Get in, saucepan man! Poor Franny will roll right past the hole if you don't hurry up! If Franny had missed the hole, she would roll right past and couldn't possibly circle back as it would be uphill. The saucepan man quickly grabbed Franny's rope from her cushion and tied it to himself. They then both fell straight through the hole to a warm welcome from the others. Thank you so much, Saucepan Man. I would have hated to be stuck in the rocking land. Thank goodness you found the whole moon face. Yes, indeed. That sure was an adventure. But we should get back to Mother. We don't want to worry her. Very good idea, Joe. Come on, Franny. Let's get home to Mother and Father. Bye, moon face. Bye, Saucepan Man. Yes, bye, children. Uh, take care of little Franny. Bye, children! Chapter 3. The land of Take What You Want. The next day was very fine. The children helped their mother to clean the whole house as all good children do. Joe proudly brought in some fresh green beans and lettuces from the garden, which he had grown himself. From the expressions on mother's face, that she seemed quite pleased. You can go off and play after lunch if you like. You've been very good today. The children looked at one another in glee. It was the reward they had hoped for after all. Good. Uh, come on. Uh, we, we won't waste any time. What about something to drink? Shouldn't we take some lemonade with us? I should think we can get some lemonade all right from the land of Take What You Want. They all ran off, waving to Mother as they went. They were soon in the enchanted wood, hearing the trees whispering secretly to one another. They ran through the bushes and trees of the faraway tree and went up. When they passed the window of the angry pixie, Joe peeped in just for fun but he was very sorry he did. The angry pixie was there, and he threw a bowl of cold soup all over poor Joe. Oh, you wicked pixie. The angry pixie went off in peals of delighted laughter and banged his window shut. Who? You smell of onions now, Joe. I hope the smell soon wears off. Furious as Joe was, he wiped himself down with a handkerchief, and when no one was listening, he vowed to pay the angry pixie back. Come on, we'll never get there. They passed the barn owl's door and saw him sitting inside, fast asleep. They came out to Silky's little yellow door, but she wasn't in. There was a note pinned on her door that said, Out. Back soon. She must be with Moonface, sir. Now look out for Dame Washalot's water, everyone. It was a good thing he reminded them. Not long after that, a fine ball's full of soapy studs came pouring down. Franny screamed and dodged. So did Beth. Joe got some on his shirt and he was very cross. Never mind. It will wash off some of the onion soup, Joe. They went on up and came to Mr. Watts' names. He was, as usual, sitting in a deck chair, fast asleep with his mouth open. Beside him, also fast asleep, was the old saucepan man, looking most uncomfortable, draped around as usual with saucepans and kettles. Don't wake them. We'd better not stop and talk. So they crept by them, 
but just as they had got to the next branch, the saucepan man woke up. He sniffed hard and jabbed Mr. Watson's name. What's the matter? What's the matter? Can you smell onions? I distinctly smell them. Do you suppose the faraway tree is growing onions anywhere near us today? Oh, I love onion soup. Joe and the girls laughed until they cried. It's the onion soup on your shirt that saucepan man smelt. Belle spent all afternoon looking for onions growing on the faraway tree now. They left the two funny old men and went climbing up, and they got nicely caught by Dame Washlot's second lot of water. She was doing a great deal of washing that day, and she emptied a big wash tub down just as the three children were nearly underneath. The water came pouring down and soaked all the children. They gasped and shook themselves like dogs. Quick, uh, we'll go as fast as we can to Moonface's house and borrow some towels from him. Oh, this is dreadful. They arrived at Moonface's at last. Old Moonface and Silky rushed out to hug them, but when they saw how dripping wet the children were, they stopped in surprise. Is it raining? Have you had a bath in your clothes? No, it's just Dame Washalot's water as usual. We dodged the first lot, but didn't manage to dodge the second lot. Can you lend us towels? Moonface grinned and pulled some towels out of his curved cupboard. As the children rubbed themselves down, Moonface told them about the land of Take What You Want. It, it's a marvellous land. You're allowed to wander all over it and take whatever you want for yourselves without paying a penny. Everyone goes there if they can. Uh, do come and visit it with me and Silky. Is it uh, quite, quite safe? Oh yes. The only thing we must be careful of is to not stay there for too long in case it leaves the faraway tree and we can't get down. But Moonface says he'll sit by the ladder and give a loud whistle if he sees any sign of the land moving away. Good. Well, there's plenty of things we want, so let's go now, shall we? They all climbed up to the topmost branch of the great white cloud. The ladder led through the hole as usual to the land above. One by one they climbed it and stood in a strange country above the magic cloud. It was indeed strange. It was simply clouded with things and people. It was quite difficult to move about. Animals of all kinds wandered here and there. Stacks of all sorts of things, from gold to potatoes, stood about. All sorts of the most wonderful fruits and vegetables were everywhere, and even things such as chairs and tables were found just waiting for anyone to take them. Good gracious! Can we really take anything we want? Anything? Look at those gnomes over there. They mean to take all of the gold they can find. The children looked where Moonface was pointing. Sure enough, there were four gnomes hauling at the sacks of gold in sight. One by one, they staggered off to the ladder with them and disappeared down the faraway tree. Other fairy folk hunted for all different things they wanted. Dresses, coats, shoes, singing birds, pictures of all kinds. As soon as they found what they were looking for, they rushed off down the ladder in glee and slipped down it. Moonface found it fun to watch them. The others wandered off, looking at everything in surprise. Do you want a fat lion, Joe? Uh, no, thank you. Well, what about a giraffe? I believe they make fine pets. You believe wrong, then. Nobody in their senses would want to keep a giraffe as a pet. Oh, look! Do let's take a clock back home. No, thank you. We know what we want, and we'll take that and nothing else. I think I should like a clock. What about this one? It's very nice and smiley face and has two feet underneath. It's lovely. It wants to walk. Oh, do let it, Silky. I've never seen a clock walk before. Silky put the clock down and it trotted beside them on its big, flat feet. The children thought it was the funniest thing they had ever seen. Silky was very pleased with her new clock. It was the kind that chimed every hour on the hour and sometimes in between two. It had to be wound up with a key every night to keep it ticking. Just as I've always wanted, I shall keep it in the back of my room. You don't suppose it will stay there, do you, Silky? It will wander round and poke its nose at everything you're doing. And if it doesn't like it, it will run away. The clock suddenly climbed cheerily, making them all jump. It stopped walking when it chimed, but it ran after the children and Silky again soon after. It really was the most extraordinary clock. Now we really must look for what we want. Are those hens over there, Beth? Yes, they are. Good. Come along and we'll get them. Oh, this really is a lovely land. I'm so glad we came. What fun it will be getting everything we want. 
but I do wonder what Mother will say when we get home. <laughs>